Okay, Eugene, take it away. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know, I'm a little long-winded, and um, I'm getting reverb. Ah, okay. And uh, when I was asked to give um, 3,500 words, I did a couple words over, and I tried recording this yesterday or day before. Uh, in case I wasn't able to get on, the recording could get played. And at 56 minutes, I still wasn't done. So if I don't complete it today um, in the talk, in the time allotted, because I don't want to go over, uh, you have the talk in the manuscript. Uh, anyway, to get started, when Moses was given the law, the Torah. The Lord gave it as a one-year um, ordinance or one-year procession of things to be committed. And that is become known as the acceptable year of the Lord. If we're to be accepted of the Lord, we need to do that for one year. The most important thing we need to create Zion today, besides obedience, is what's known as the Tabernacle of David. In the scriptures, the Tabernacle of David are, was outlined to be brought forth in our day, or to be restored. So we're going to go over the little bit of the back history of the Tabernacle of David. Um, the scriptures that I use mostly predominantly in the Old Testament are the Hebrew to English from Chabad.org. Uh, it's spelled Shabbat uh, with a C-H, but pronounced Chabad. And then I also tend to use the Joseph Smith, Ma not Joseph Smith, but the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, which is a direct translation from he Hebrew to English. Uh, so the scriptures, they're, they're almost the same as King James, but there are variations. Uh, so let's get into it. The tent or tabernacle of David was set up because Yehovah allowed the Gentiles to, or Philistines, to desecrate and capture the Ark of the Covenant because of the wickedness of Israel. Same has happened now. We don't have an Ark. We don't have a temple because of wickedness of the people in abandoning the covenant delivered to us at Mount Horeb as Israel. The outward ordinances were being observed at that time, but the spirit of the law was no longer being observed. We have the tent uh, of David set up so Yehovah could be worshipped in spirit and in truth, as well as the outward ordinances. We find from history the the ark was taken because Israel was losing at war. Now, I have listed here in 1 Samuel um, chapter 4, verses 1 th through 18. And for brevity's sake, I'm not going to uh, go over them all. But let's start at verse 10, if you have the manuscript open or your scriptures. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man to his tent, and there was great, great slaughter, for there fell, fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. The ark was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, were slain. Now what's interesting is when the ark was brought into the camp, the Israelites gave, gave a great shout. They assumed they were going to win, and that the Philistines would be destroyed just as the Egyptians. What they didn't take into account was their own wickedness. Now, Eli, um, when he heard that his sons were dead, it didn't really affect him, but what hurt him was when he heard the ark was captured. Then he fell over because he was worried about the ark. When Samuel was a child, one of the first things that he gave as a revelation was to Eli that the Lord would take everything away from him and his family. But it wasn't until many years later 
when he was an old man that that was fulfilled right here in this scripture. But in 1 Samuel 6, 1 through 3, uh, to paraphrase, the Philistines had the ark for seven months. And during that time, God afflicted them horribly. Uh, mice ran over everywhere the ark was, and they had great boils all over their body, um, oozing sore. And also, when they put the ark in the temple of the god Dana, every night the temple fell down and was prostrate before the ark when they came in the next morning. They wanted to get rid of the ark. So they, they came up with a way to get rid of it. And when they did return it to Israel, Samuel said, said to the people, um, and this is First Samuel chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, and I'll read 3. He told the people, do if, and I'm, I'll read just the uh, underlined part here. If you do return to the Lord with all your hearts and put away the strange gods and Astaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord to serve him only, he will deliver you. Now, this is uh, very important because it applies to our day. We're coming into a time where we're going to need to be saved. And the only place it says, if you will not take up your sword against your neighbor, you must needs flee to Zion. Well, these words of Samuel apply to us today. Um, later, when the people turn to their wickedness after having covenanted to righteousness, in the Book of Mormon, you learn about the cycle, and it's a three year cycle. Uh, People get rich, they get um, full of themselves, and then they have a war, they get poor, they get humble, they get repentant, and they obey the Lord till they get rich and full of themselves again. Well, here Israel had rejected the Lord and gone back like a dog to its vomit. And the Lord told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And that's like they say, Samuel, First uh, Samuel 8, 7 and 8. And in 8, um, the Lord is, they've forsaken me to serve other gods. And when people want a king or they want a prophet or they want somebody to stand as an intermediator, intermediary between them and God, they, um, they're serving another God instead of the true God of Israel. The question is, why did David erect a new tent or tabernacle? The answer is found in Ezekiel. David wanted to approach God. But here's the commandment that's in Numbers, uh, chapter 1, 50 through 53. Um, Thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all things belonging to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it. 51. Uh, just the highlighted. When the tabernacle set it forward, the Levites shall take it down. When the tabernacle be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And that's the key. Anyone that's not a Levite that enters the temple is to be slain, according to the original you know, the way it was set up with Moses. Verse 53, the Levites shall pitch round about the ta tabernacle of testimony, that there shall be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. So the Levites are supposed to surround the temple or the tabernacle, so nobody could enter it but a Levite. Um, so they wouldn't be killed. And if they tried to force their way, the Levites were there to defend and stop the entry into the temple. Um, David knew from reading the scriptures as the king was supposed to uh, read the Torah every day, that God wanted people to approach him. David wanted to approach the God of Israel. But according to the commandment, he couldn't. He was not a Levite. He was of Judah and of Ephraim. And so there was no way he could enter into the temple. Um, 
Ezekiel um, 44, 15 through 16 is also something else that David knew. And I'll go to verse 11 and 15. But, uh, and they shall be ministers for my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house. The ministering to the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifices for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. Now this is interesting. God values those who value him. And when all the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf, there were Levites that did not. They stood aside. And when Moses asked for somebody to help, it was the sons of Zadok. So God has allowed them. And that's one of the reasons he took them unto himself. But continuing on. Um, as I said, King David was of the tribes of Ephraim and Judah, primarily Judah. And being of this lineage, he was not allowed into the tabernacle that Moses had constructed. And David sought to enter into the presence of the Lord. Some mistakenly assume King David um, was instituting a new form of worship, one that was to supplant uh, the original uh, worship set up by Yehovah at Mount Horeb. And this substitution would take place fully after the atonement. I've had multiple people tell me this. And it's not because David was to keep the sacrifices being performed in the original tabernacle and of the testimony. But David added new spiritual sacrifices to the tent he raised in Jerusalem. Additionally, David had the commanded sacrifices performed in the new tent or the tabernacle of David as well. The, and we have uh, chronicled here in uh, First Chronicles 16, and it's the whole chapter, 1 through 43. And again, for brevity, I'm not going to go through it. It's there to be read. But I will hit the high points. There's uh, verse 4. And he appointed certain Levites to minister before the ark and to record and to thank and praise the Lord of Israel. And so the ark was in Jerusalem where the tabernacle of David was. He left the original tabernacle where it was after it was recovered from the Philistines. Chapter 8. Give thanks to the Lord, call him on his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name, and let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Now the thing is, that's very interesting, is by doing this and adding singers in the temple, people could come in that were not Levites to worship and know the Lord. And this is something that the Lord originally wanted at Mount Horeb, but the people refused. Um, be ye mindful always, in verse 15, of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. This is an important statement. When the covenant was made at Horeb, it was never to be done away. It was never to be put on the back burner. That is a lie we have inherited, as Jeremiah says, from our fathers. The covenant was made to a thousand generations until all things are fulfilled. That's why Christ said, um, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all is fulfilled, or the, the law or the prophets. So the, the singing and the institution of Levites and choirs in the temple, uh, we can find, well, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Uh, now, it's interesting. And here we have in King David talking to, it's recorded in Chronicles, but it's for our day. In verse 34 and 35, um, verse 36. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glorify thee, glorify, glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. When this was written, Israel was together. They hadn't been scattered. King David was their king, and then Solomon would come after. This was written for our day. David was a prophet, a great and mighty prophet. Um, but here he was talking about when Israel was scattered throughout the earth and needed to be gathered together, and they needed to be saved from the coming um, destructions. This is the part of the prayer that needs to be sung in the tabernacle, in the temple when it's raised. Um, verse 40, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord upon the altar of burnt offerings continually morning and evening, and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. Now, this is interesting because Charlotte mentioned the rainbow and the covenant when Israel obeys all of the law. You see, people want to establish Zion. Zion will not be established until all the law is obeyed. And these burnt offerings were commanded, if you read the Torah, until all things are fulfilled and to a thousand generations. And so long as men are being born upon the earth. So far as I know, those three things haven't happened yet. So the law is still enforced, but we're not living it. We're not keeping Torah. Um, anyway, I will skip on ahead here. Um, after David put the tabernacle in, the tabernacle of David, anyone could approach uh, the Lord. Before, only once a year, the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies or the special place. But David, we read, went when Bathsheba's baby um, was dying and prayed every day before the ark. How did he get in there? If to go through the Levite's chamber um, was death. In the tabernacle of David, there was an extra chamber, one on the back of the tabernacle. We learned this in Ezekiel, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. Um, it's interesting, in Exodus 20, verses 18 through 20, when God was talking to Moses and about the people, and, well, I'll read it, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Now that's interesting. God wanted them to come up. They refused. Then verse 20, what Moses told them, and Moses said to the people, fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, that ye sin not. This one sentence, from that time till today, God has come to prove his people. But we keep letting other people tell us what the scriptures, instead of coming to the Lord, and we separate ourselves from God by listening to prophets, by listening to people that are willing to stand up and fill the niche. Um, because don't let us talk to God. 
Well, God wants us to come to him. He wants us to know him. He says in Zion, every man shall know God. But let's go on. Sorry. Um, in Deuteronomy 18, Moses goes over with this again, just before he dies in his great last speech. And according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in, in this is Deuteronomy 18, 16, in the day of assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. So this is the fear of men um, that don't want to approach God. And fear hath no place in the kingdom of heaven. Yehovah wanted the people to come and hear his voice and know him, but the people refused to come before Yehovah because of their fear. And let me tell you, the only reason people don't meet Yehovah right now today is their fear. If you have not spoken with the Lord face to face, either in vision or in the flesh, there's only one reason. And that is, there's something inside you that is blocking it and the fear of your unworthiness is keeping you from his presence. Yehovah wants to speak with each and every one of us. Um, Yeshua died so we could have that privilege. If we're not doing it, it's because of our fear. And this scripture goes, doesn't say it specifically in that way, but it tells us why we don't approach Yehovah. Um, as I said before, there's no, uh, about the back chamber, there's no direct record in scripture as how this new tabernacle looked so where did i get it but scripture does tell us how it was constructed indirectly david was not a levite so could not enter the first chamber of the tabernacle that was set aside exclusively for levites to get to the ark how did david solve this problem it was to add another chamber to the opposite side of the holy of holies this was not told of directly in scripture, but a temple built in this section fashion can be found within scripture. We have the prophecy of Amos that starts at the death of Yeshua Yoshia and extends to our day. And then we additionally have the temple in Ezekiel that is yet to be built, but that temple is a chamber by chamber description. But let's start with um, Amos here. And it's interesting, Amos starts at the destruction of Jerusalem and in this chamber comes to our day. Saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, smite the lintel of the door that the posts may shake. Here's something that's interesting. When the savior was crucified, and he, don't, and he died, this lintel of the temple cracked in half, and the uh, veil ripped in half. And from that moment on, no one could enter in to the Holy of Holies or into the chamber of the Levites to perform. And if you read this historical record, from that time on, the Sanhedrin, instead of entering in to hold their meetings, had to do it in the um, marketplace outside of the temple. So here is Amos prophesying of that happening. And then, um, jumping to verse 5, the Lord God of hosts is he that touches the land and it shall melt. Now. Um, Malachi teaches us that at the second coming, the Lord is going to come as a consuming fire. And he and all the righteous will cause everybody to be ashes under their feet. The whole earth shall be destroyed and melted at his coming on the surface, except those who have been changed, like Paul says. When he comes, we shall be like, when he comes, we shall be like him. Well, he's coming as a consuming fire. So those that have had the baptism of fire 
will be safe because they will be as flames. And as Malachi rightly says, everything, all the wicked, shall become ashes under the feet. So verse 5 is again prophesying the second coming. But then we jump just before that, um, just before that to verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saying, I will not utter to utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. The Lord will not utterly destroy those of Israel. Interesting, we talked about circumcision. You don't have to be circumcised to join the Lord's people. But if you want to be safe in Zion, if you want to be safe during the second coming, you need to be circumcised because then you will be of the family of Jacob. And the Lord tells us right here, he will not utterly destroy Jacob. But in Malachi, everybody that is not part of Jacob, and you don't have to be born of Israel, but if you enter the covenant of circumcision, you become part of Israel. That is the promise. Continue on. Verse 9. I will sift the house of Israel among all the nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall to the earth. Verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. So the Lord's going to judge the whole earth, the Gentiles, but also the house of Israel. And those that do not meet his standard will be destroyed by the sword in the times that are coming. Um, then we get to what Amos said about the fallen tabernacle. And in that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is falling and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. So here is the key in our day. We need to return to Torah, but we cannot do it by building a temple. The temple comes after. You know, the temple in Israel was not built till 400 years after Israel entered into the land. And Ezekiel's temple is not going to be built until after the Savior in reigns and he, David's seed is sitting on the throne under the Savior doing all the administrative work. Before that, we need to return to Torah. And that only will happen when we raise the acceptable tabernacle of David and fulfill the covenant and keep all the commandments of the Torah, the year of acceptance. Um, that means we have to keep it for a minimum of one year. The Lord tells us, when they cry to me, I will not come because of their wickedness at first. Well, that's because most people are not going to live the covenant until they're forced into it because they don't think they have to. And when they're hurting enough, they're going to build this tabernacle of David, and they're going to raise it, and they're going to start keeping it. But we have to keep it for a full year before we're accepted. We have to fulfill every jot and tittle of the covenant made in Mount Horeb. And while we're doing that, Satan is going to be, Hasatan is going to be cast out of heaven, and then he's going to come to make war with the saints and make our lives as miserable as he possibly can. Um, that's verse 11 is basically telling us that if you combine it with other scriptures. But I need to go on. Verse 14. And I will bring in the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. And they also shall make gardens and eat the fruit of them. Um, that's our promise. The Lord will come and we will be his people, his captives, as he says here. But it's willing captives because we will be protected by him 
and the millennium will be restored and we will be safe. Um, I basically talked about this part as I went through it. Uh, but we're also told that in our day, it is David's tabernacle. It's the one that Yeshua Yeshua will come to and meet his people from. This is found in the apostles' interpretation of Amos found in the book of Acts. Paul just went through the chapter I did, and you'll find in Acts chapter 15, verses 14 through 18, Paul talks about this, and he talks about the last day. And it says, uh, Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, verse 16, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue, that's important, God's a wordsmith, the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord. The Lord's going to destroy a lot of people. He's not going to destroy every non-LDS or non-person in Zion. He will save the righteous that were good people but misled. Um, but very few of them. Uh, in some scriptures, it's called the remnant. Here, it's called the residue. Uh, there will be left over, but if you want to be where it's safe, I recommend being in Zion. I hope to be there, but to continue. What exactly does Ezekiel tell us the structure he was told about? And Ezekiel chapter 40, um, 44 through 46, reading 44, and without the inner gate were the chapels of the singers in the inner court, which was the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south, one of the sides of the east gate. Now, the temple has to be built facing east because the Lord is coming from the east. So to be in the north or the south or the west, to give you an idea of what it's talking about. So the singers are going to be on the north. Um, let me jump down here. We have Ezekiel 41, 12 through 15. Now the building that was before the separate place, the separate place is Ezekiel's way of saying Holy of Holies. At the end thereof, toward the west, was 70 cubits broad, and the wall of the building was five cubits thick roundabout, and the length thereof 90 cubits. Now this is interesting because we have the eastern side of the building where the Levite's chamber is in the menorah and the shoe bread table and the incense and all of that. Then you have the Holy of Holies, okay? But the west, there is a new chamber. You ask the Jews today, what's that chamber? And they couldn't tell you. An LDS person can tell you. It's an endowment room. It's a place where the priesthood or a non-Levite could enter in to the temple and enter through the veil into the Holy of Holies, just as David did. That's why it's called David's Tabernacle. It had the extra room, but it was a tent just preceding the temple. Well, David's tabernacle is the tent that precedes this temple in the millennium. Um, anyway, to continue on, uh, that it's interesting to study that temple, and I would really, it, you know, ask you to. Uh, let me see here. Here we find a description of the building found within the inner court. This is the building that contains the Holy of Holies or separate place. This building consists of one long room divided into two chambers, and yet this building's first room was 70 cubits broad or wide, 
and the entire building was 100 feet long, including the five foot thick walls. Next, we're told, the building behind the separate place. This is three stories tall and include side galleries that hold, that house the singers on the north and the Levites on the south. And then you have the west. Um, this building was never in King Sol Solomon's temple, never. But the extra space had to be in David's tent so he could access the Holy of Holies from the new chamber at the back of the tent. This has been confirmed by the Holy Spirit to me. Um, I've seen it. I've walked in it in uh, vision. But anyway, this covers the physical temple to be built. But what are the tent or tabernacle? We're told in scripture that first Israel must return to Jehovah in the countries where he has driven us. Then and only then will Jehovah gather us back uh, as his people. Now this is uh, what Israel, they say since the temple was destroyed, there's no place on the earth that sacrifices can be done. Um, they say that um, there's no place sanctified because the Lord tells us we need to only build a temple where the Lord has set his name. Well, LDS or those of the LDS learning should know two things. There's only two places the Lord has officially set his name. One is Jerusalem and the other was in here in Missouri at um, Adam on Diamond in the temple lot. What's interesting, the Lord allowed his name to be set when they were driven out of Missouri here in Nauvoo. And yet the people sinned. Joseph Smith was taken. The protection that they were promised they never got because they never fulfilled the commandment in the way God, he said, you have a certain amount of time. But that's a whole nother, nother talk. Let's jump to um, Deuteronomy and Nehemiah. Now, in Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 4, the Lord gives us a promise through Moses. And it shall come to pass when all these things, meaning the curses that Moses had just outlined, uh, come upon thee, and the or the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, thou shalt call them to mind among the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, and all with all thine heart and with all thine soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have kept compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Now that's quite a promise. Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy everything that would happen to Israel. And he prophesied the curse when they abandoned and everything. And then here is how Zion is going to be formed. How God is going to return and turn to his people. And Nehemiah chapter, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 7 and 9, when Nehemiah was rededicating the temple, um, after being away in Babylon and being in wickedness, he recalled this promise in his prayer. And um, I'm just going to read nine to save time. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast to the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from things and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name. Now, you know, Deuteronomy and Nehemiah, well, let me read the next scripture too. Um, oh, oh, I just told I have three minutes. Ha! Um, okay, let me put it this way. If we want to 
create Zion. You can talk all you want, you can do everything, but if you don't stop, I mean, start keeping Torah and do it for a year in an acceptable manner, God is going to turn a deaf ear because he said, this is my commandment. And then he gave us Torah. And I don't know too many places in scripture. I went through looking every, every scripture I knew where it says, I, the Lord God, saith, this is my commandment. You know what? There ain't many of them outside of the Torah. Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, had a 70-week ministry. He started just before the Passover, doing, uh, he was baptized and getting uh, his apostles together the first few couple of weeks but then he started at passover and he lived the full year till the next passover and there he was crucified during that year he marked the path he showed us the way and then said come follow me he gave us an acceptable year and how we must live it. We need to establish the tabernacle of David. And we need to do an acceptable year of obedience, keeping the commandment that was given to all generations, keeping the commandment that we were told to live until all things are fulfilled. Yeah, I've received all the arguments from everybody saying, oh, the Book of Mormon says this, and the Book of Mormon says that, and you, the Doctrine and Covenant says this, and the New Testament says that. But here's the thing, if you read the New Testament in Acts, you'll find that they kept the Torah. Paul, the reason he was arrested and taken to Rome was because after his missions, 20 years after the Savior's death, they said they're teaching that you don't keep the Torah and you need to go show and we're going to put eight men with you to keep the ordinances with you to testify. And they all shaved their head and they kept all the ordinances of purification for eight days and entered into the temple because why they were keeping the torah if it was done away why was paul and all of the apostles still living it we've been taught it's done away through the incorrect traditions of our father given um by the catholic church and all the protestant churches from them as jeremiah teaches we have inherited lies there is more to my talk you can read it but oh i was just told i have 10 minutes i'm sorry <laughs> um the thing is we have uh, surely my screen went blank you have to bring it up sorry we have the law given to us. What's interesting in Third Nephi, in chapter 15 of the LDS, sorry I'm not familiar with the RLDS scripture to tell you off memory, but that says, you know, those things that have not yet, I've come to fulfill the law, and I have fulfilled the law and the law in me is fulfilled. Everybody takes that automatically to say, see, it's fulfilled. Go down a couple verses and it says, those things that are not yet fulfilled shall be fulfilled in me. And uh, so if the law is supposed to be going till all things 
are fulfilled. And then the Lord says, he who endures to the end. So we need to endure to the end of keeping everything until all things are fulfilled. And, um, okay, let me go, since I have time, to Ezekiel 11, 16, 20. Thus saith, and again, I'm starting 16. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. 18. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from things. And I will give them one heart, and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out from your flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20. That they may walk in my statutes, and keep mine ordinances, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Okay? We have a stony heart. We want to fight and piss and moan with each other over little points of doctrine. Who has the priesthood authority, etc., etc., yada, yada. We need to um, come to the Lord in humility, in meekness, and obey and keep his ordinances, his statutes, as he has outlined. Um, I'm sorry, I'm searching here, but I'm going down to Isaiah 16, 2 through 7. For it shall be as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Aaron. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of new, this new day. Hide the outcast, betray not them that, that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the executioner, uh, extortioner, is at an end. The spoiler ceaseth. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. And in mercy shall the throne be established. And he shall sit upon it in truth. In the tabernacle of David. Judging and seeking judgment. And hastening righteousness. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is very proud. Even of his haughtiness. And his pride. And his wrath but his lies shall not be so. Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab. Everyone shall howl for the foundations of Kir Hersheneth shall be mourned. Surely they are stricken. The Lord is telling us in the last days when people are fighting to find a place of refuge. It's interesting, we have Moab here in Utah, or in Utah, and the Moab in Jerusalem, or the Jordan today. But it's the tabernacle that the Lord is telling us here, he's coming to, to save his people. And um, we need to live an acceptable year of the Lord. So, in mercy will the throne of David be reestablished with the one that is mighty and strong. When truth, Yeshua Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, returns to the tabernacle of David because Israel has returned to the covenant set forth at Mount Horeb, the children turning their hearts to their righteous fathers, and then the righteous fathers 
can return to dwell with their obedient posterity. At that moment, the true kingdom of God will be established once again upon the earth. Like the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, it will roll down to fill the entire earth. You know, it's interesting. The Lord said, though you're at the far extent of heavens, I will gather you. And that was given before uh, the ten tribes took off. And we know from Joseph Smith that that part will return to the earth. And uh, so <laughs> we have the scripture. We need to live the acceptable year of the Lord. We need to build the tabernacle of David to live the acceptable year of the Lord. And when that happens, the Lord tells us in scripture, he will come to us. Um, you know, it's interesting. Everything is in scripture. I've heard a lot of people say a lot, say a lot of theories on how they think Zion will be established. When the Lord has told you plainly, told me, told all of us, I will walk among you if you keep these commandments. What commandments? The ones he delivered at Mount Horeb. For people that really want to see the Lord in our midst, it's simple. Keep the Torah. Establish the tabernacle of David. Anyway, Thank you for your time. I'm finished when I say this in the name of Yeshua. Yeshua. Amen. He can hear you. Yep, for questions and answers. Yes. So. Sure. Okay. Uh, Eugene, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Your first question. Um, what about the temples at Elephantine and Heliopolis? Did the Lord set his name there or were they illegitimate? Um, there's no record of the Lord setting the name there. Now, the thing is, we have the tabernacle, and the tabernacle is mobile, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, so, it can be temples there if they were tabernacles, moved there temporarily. And we have the tabernacle in our day, which in scriptures tell us once the Lord builds the, taber the temple, the tabernacle will still be established. Something people don't consider. Uh, when Joseph Smith dedicated the temple lot in Utah, uh, not Utah, here in Missouri, there were 12 or 24 buildings. They were not temples, they were schools. And the, the Lord says, the voice of the Lord shall come from Jerusalem, but the law shall come from Zion. Well, we will have the tabernacle here in Zion, and the law will come from those 24 buildings established in um, here in Missouri. But the Lord will speak with the one mighty and strong in Jerusalem in Ezekiel's temple, as is outlined in Ezekiel's vision. So we will have both. But as far as anywhere outside of those two places, nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures is that found. I know there are other works that state it, but um, that so far as the Hebrew scriptures and God, what God has revealed directly, it's not, not anywhere but those two places. You ready for your next one? You said that the Lord wants to speak with everyone and that the main thing that holds people back from speaking with him is fear. 
What thoughts can you share about how to overcome that fear? Learn the Lord. Uh, Charlotte mentioned reading the scriptures and receiving revelations. That's the best way to get to know your Savior. Um, for years, I had a reading thing that, you know, uh, President Ezra Taft Benson said, you should read from the Book of Mormon every day. So I started reading from the Book of Mormon every day. Then in the leadership meeting, I was told, you should read from Third Nephi every day. So I started reading not only from First Nephi to the end, but I would also read a chapter a day out of Third Nephi. And then I realized I needed to know the Savior. So I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John every day in rotation, one chapter a day. Then I realized I didn't know the Lord, so I started reading the Old Testament. Well, by doing this reading schedule, then I learned um, I wanted to know how to understand Revelation. The Lord commanded me in reading Third Nephi, as he commands everybody, read Isaiah. So I started reading a chapter of Isaiah every day. Then um, I added Revelations every day, the book of Daniel, one chapter every day. And something magical happened. I got to know the Savior. By reading the New Testament, I got to know the Savior. And reading his voice in Third Nephi, reading his voice in the New Testament, pretty soon I recognized his voice in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Revelations. And I became closer to the Lord and Revelation started opening up to the point that I have spent hours talking with the Lord in vision at night. I'm taken to the mountain of the Lord. I get to sit there and ask him questions, talk with him, complain to him, have him chew me out, have him teach me, comfort me. You get to know your Savior by approaching him. The only way we have to really approach him is the scriptures. You get to know him and he becomes your friend. You're never afraid of your friend. But if you spend your time making yourself a friend to the world, doing worldly things, worldly pursuits, movies, books, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're a friend to the world. But if you spend your time knocking, seeking, searching for the Lord to know him, your mind will go at night and the Lord will talk to you as he promises in scripture. And you will get to know, and he's my master, but he's my friend. That's how I found there's no other way except to put in your due diligence. There's no shortcuts. There's no, you know, easy, uh, oh, I can't even think of it, crib notes. You have to, the Lord loves those who love him. Honest effort brings honest results. That's what I found. Next. <laughs> Hope that helps. All right, I'm going to combine the last two questions. They're both about the tabernacle slash temple of David. Um, how, do we, how do we establish the tabernacle of David? What is it? Where do you believe the tabernacle slash temple of David will be built? Um, okay, there's two tabernacle of David. If you read in Maccabees, when Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant, he also hid the Tabernacle of David. But we have in Moses, uh, the, the Torah, 
complete instructions for a tabernacle. Um, there's two buildings where the Lord gives a lot. And those are, I mean, the structure of the tabernacle and the structure of the temple of Ezekiel, they take up more scripture per capita than anything else on their, on their particular subject. We can build, take donations, a, temp, a tabernacle building fund. It has to be voluntary. It can't be put upon people. If you read, uh, Moses says, okay, I need donations. And everybody took their earrings off and their nose rings and they threw it into the pot. And God says, I need so many lamb skins dyed red. I need so much linen. And the women started weaving. People donated it. Well, we got to do the same thing. I mean, people are willing to put up 25, 30, 40 million dollars for a stupid temple that really doesn't do a whole lot. Um, in fact, if you read uh, Zechariah and some of the others, those temples, every temple that's been raised is an abomination before God. And he says every altar in those temples is an altar to sin. Um, but people don't know their Old Testament enough to know that. But we have the instructions. So God's not going to, you know, tell us to do what we already have before us. It's up to us to, um, for he who is commanded in all things is a slothful servant. We've already been shown. It's just we've got to get off our duff and do it, build it. I mean, the tabernacle's not a cheap thing. The menorah itself is a $5 million piece of gold. <laughs> but then you have all the, um, boards that are coated in gold in the holy of holies and you have the shoe bread table and that they're wood but they're coat you know they're gold leaf uh you have different things so we have to build these things um and it's our responsibility in the scripture i read today it said that um it shall be raised up the breaches thereof healed so that means we have to follow the directions. Um, too many people don't follow directions, even though they're in scriptures. And we can build it. And if we build it, he will come. <laughs>